Okay, welcome to this uh, final breakout panel, Building a 21st Century Canadian Labour Force. I'm Anthony Germain. My guests, um, I've known the seating arrangement, Jessit Cote, uh, Kelly Lenze, gotta make sure I get Arvind Gupta, and I don't want to blow your name, Indira Samar Samarasakera? Yes, Very perfect. excellent. <laughs> Um, I, will, I won't bother with what it is they do in life because I think these things will come uh, to be fairly obvious in the uh, initial answer to their first question. I just want to go to one of the slides here in my prep for this. Uh, slide four. Uh, you take a look at this, and this is where I'm going to start the questions off, when we sort of foresee a future where we're going to have a shortage like this in these sectors, 163,000 in construction. You can read the figures. I won't read them for you. 60,000 in nursing. And I have to say, I've been back in Canada from Beijing now for a year, and apart from the bizarre culture shock of moving from Beijing to St. John's, Newfoundland, over the last year, two bizarre Newfoundland stories, and Newfoundland, as you know, is going through a tremendous uh, change of its own right now. Now it's becoming a, an energy power in its own right. But there are two bizarre stories. One, a fish plant operator having to bring in workers from Thailand. So I think, okay, this is Newfoundland. They can't find people in Newfoundland to work in a fish plant. And in Labrador, which is a whole other aspect of my, my new province, uh, Filipino workers being brought in to work in both construction and in Tim Hortons. Um, and so in a small place like Newfoundland, you're already seeing, I think, strange aberrations in labor demands for odd jobs. And I guess if we'll just start in any order, I, I want to know your general concerns when you look at a future like this where clearly we are not going to have the people we need in key sectors. What are your thoughts about the challenges this presents to the country, not just in terms of education, but also immigration and corporate responsibility in assuring that we actually have these skills leading to the future. So maybe, uh, Jacin Cote, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah. And I think uh, when you look at the GDP growth for Canada, well, it takes two things, more people, more GDP per capita. GDP per capita, we're not doing extremely well in terms of productivity, so we'll need to continue working hard at it. And we all know from a demography perspective, the people leaving the workspace uh, versus people getting in, it's going to be a deficit. So those are examples of the numbers. And we already have hotspots in Canada. Yeah, we have operations in Labrador, so fly in, fly out mm -hmm. is starting to be part of the solution. I know our friends from Bombardier will be pretty happy with that. Uh, but it's creating a fairly significant issue. So we do have pockets right now, hotspots in Canada, where we do see uh, the issue. We're having U.S. workers in, in our construction site uh, in Kitimat right now. Actually, U.S. was uh, more skills and not much more expensive than... Um, Locals? They, yeah, so uh, U.S. worker was a pretty good recipe. But the thing, I think we're going to have to work on two things, uh, having better utilization of the workforce in Canada, and, and Aboriginal population is a very critical topic more than ever. Mm -hmm. People will need to work longer. Uh, that's where We all need to face that as well. But immigration will be more needed than ever. And um, I've been asked to work on a task force on international education, which is, um, I'll probably stop there and give okay. a chance for others to talk, but safest immigration and probably one of the best way to continue bringing substantial income for Canada, better funding for universities. And even if they don't stay, some of the best diplomatic bridges we can expect with the rest of We're the We're definitely going to get into some other slides uh, pertaining to education and training, and uh, we'll get into immigration. But since you opened the door to uh, the potential for Canada's Aboriginal people, uh, maybe, Kelly, you'd like to jump in here. Sure. You know, it reminds me, uh, I used to say to my dad, I have 101 ideas. And he says, one of them a job. <laughs> and I, I, think, I think this slide speaks to uh, what I think many of you people know in this room is we have the fastest growing source, solution source. It's the Aboriginal market. You all know the same demographics. 50% are under 25 years of age. But it's basically 1967. It's the 70s. Um, in the Aboriginal communities, they're, they're not too fluxed that, you know, old age went up to, 19, uh, to, to 67. They're not really talking about RSPs. They're talking about health care. They're talking about job. They're talking about community development. So history is replaying itself. And what's really exciting is as Aboriginal people are entering, today in this decade, if you look back 20 years ago, we now have Aboriginal people in every sector of the economy. Every university and college in this, in this country now has Aboriginal business education programs. Mm -hmm. I was director of the first Aboriginal business education program at the university in the, in the mid-90s. Now everyone has one. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it should be. But it's going further. Groups like uh, Simon Fraser are actually educating all people in how to actually do indigenous business. 
And so I look at these numbers, and, and I like the conversation this morning about strategy and tactics, and it sort of reminds me of, it's sort of like strategy without action is like a canoe on dry land. You can paddle all you want, but you gotta get wet. And I look at this, we've done lots of work in construction, for example, we need to get very targeted. 6,474 Aboriginal people could be part of that solution. Where could they be? And on the Aboriginal side, I know we talk a lot to companies, and we do a lot of work with companies, but it's very fragmented on the Aboriginal side to try and coordinate our communities and our people. It's fragmented, it's confusing, I see people nodding away. And I think we need to have this very frank dialogue about there, are, there is no labor market strategies now that are nationally coordinated. Yeah, that's right. Madame, you and I were talking earlier about you have yeah. to really go one on one. Yeah. And this has to change. Uh, we have national chains beyond the resource sector, which many of you in this room are, like Tim Hortons and McDonald's and Loblaws. And quite frankly, they say it's easier to work with immigrants. So it is about how do we get coordinated? We have a fast growing labor market solution. If we close the gap, the education and employment gap for Aboriginal people, bring them up to the same level as our fellow Canadians, our GDP will grow by $401 billion by 2027. That's a good news story. I'll I think pass. Aboriginal people, I think obviously when you're looking at the bricks and mortar jobs up there, you're talking about a quarter million jobs. So obviously Aboriginal people can only be part of the solution for the skills that we're gonna need in the future, albeit an important part. And I'm wondering, Indira, in given the fact that your position at the University of Alberta, uh, a very um, respected university, I went to McGill, but I was told I should have gone to your university. <laughs> <laughs> um, U of A has sort of made its mark because of the number, the percentage of uh, international students you have. Yes. Maybe you can talk a bit about uh, these linkages with um, first-rate academic institutions and its ability to attract uh, foreign students, particularly in the sciences, uh, who may uh, help us out with these problems in the future. Thank you, uh, absolutely. Um, and I'm sorry, I should mention, Indira might have to leave early, so she's not walking out on me. It's just, <laughs> I... um, can Canada has been late to the game on the international student business. Australia has been extraordinarily uh, forward-looking. They got into the international student recruitment business decades ago. Having said that, I think Canadian universities are making a rapid gains. Uh, right now, if you look at the percentage of international students in, in different countries, to give you a sense, Canada is 5% uh, in terms of, in, as a percentage of the total overall undergraduate enrollment. The United States is 18%, was 20. Britain is about 11, uh, and the UK and other top countries about 10. We just had a report from a panel convened by, I think, uh, Minister of Industry Canada, no? Uh, Foreign Affairs. Trade, Trade and, and Finance, yeah. That said, Canada should double the number of international students that we attract. So, and we need to do this coordinated effort so that we go as a brand Canada, not just here's Alberta, there's Ontario, there's British Columbia, brand Canada, because students choose countries first. The other thing that I think is relevant to this discussion is that if you look at the statistics, one third of all international students who come to this country at the undergraduate level stay here if they're given the opportunity. That's a hell of a conversion rate of ready-made Canadian graduates. How many? Oh, one third yeah. stay here. If you take graduate students, and that's a whole other challenge, we just don't have enough graduate students in the country, nearly all of the graduate students stay in the place in which they got their graduate degree. Uh, I'm certainly an example of one of them. Went to British Columbia, did my PhD, stayed there for 30 years. So um, I think we have to think strategically about how we facilitate that. Uh, so at U of A, for example, we have doubled the number of international students since I arrived, because I made that a high priority. And uh, we are working you know, strategically to go after the obvious countries. China, our enrollments have been going up enormously. Uh, India, we're doing better. Uh, but we've got to diversify. The, the comment yesterday made by Ian Bremer and others is the business that uh, Asia is not just China and India. Um, we've got all the other countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia. These are source countries. And then we should not forget Latin America because, again, there's a huge population there that's underage. Brazil, for example, uh, Chile, and so on. So I think, in conclusion, Canada needs a, a, a very robust strategy. We have a report that actually suggests that. Uh, we need the Canadian government and the uh, provincial governments to 
to invest, to enable uh, universities and colleges and technical institutes to go out strategically and get uh, this talent, and then get them to stay here. Well, what's your sense of why we're so late compared to the, the Aussies always seem to be like on the, on the edge of change and where they're supposed to be at the right time? I, you know, I think the Aussies were blessed with isolation. Right? They were blessed. They were way off there. They were, <coughs> they were isolated from the rest of the world. Uh, they, they, they attempted to, to cope with that isolation by building linkages with their neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. And their neighborhood now turns out to be the best neighborhood from which to get <laughs> students. Canada, I mean complacency, right? We have had an incredibly complacent 20 years where post-secondary education was sort of funded very marginally. Uh, the, the need for students was, was not a high priority in the minds of government. Post-secondary education has been always looked as an expense after health, right? We're an expense. Even today, we are cutting budgets at a time when we have the one... Canada is resource poor for the 21st century because the most important resource for the 21st century, human capital. And we are resource poor, and we are still not investing. So I think it's a mindset that... Uh, Federal and provincial governments need to, to come around. The final point about Australia, they have a national higher education ministry or whatever you want to call it, right? They are nationally coordinated. We don't. We have whatever numbers of, of ministries we have. Jurisdictional nightmare. And, and we are all trying to do this piecemeal, and it is not working. All right, a bit depressing, but I'll move things on. That's sort of connected. Uh, Arvind Gupka, you're uh, the CEO of MyTax. You're in the business of trying to retain brains and talent in a number of spheres. Uh, what's your sense of where we're headed facing this? Well, I, I think that these numbers are really stark and they're underestimating the problem we're going to face. The emerging sectors, the knowledge sectors, which are still relatively small in Canada, are going to grow very fast. We know the IT sector is growing mm -hmm. much faster in the economy. The biotech yeah. sector is growing very fast. Those sectors are going to face huge shortages of people. Um, let me just pick up on one point that Indira made. Our graduation rates for PhD students in Canada is about half the American rate. Yeah. We're near the bottom of the OECD. Right. Um, yeah. We are not prepared to staff up the knowledge sector as it grows. Yes. So, you know, I, I'm a professor of computer science, and I feel like Bill Gates is sitting outside my door waiting for every PhD student I graduate because the Americans have gone on that our universities are producing world-class people, and they can t track them to the U.S. So I think we have a much bigger problem coming. Mm -hmm. But um, let me put a positive spin on that. I think Canada is in a unique position in the world in being able to attract international talent. And, you know, mm -hmm. the Australians, for a long time, were very closed in, as a country towards immigration, especially immigration from Asia. Um, they opened up out of need. They, they were isolated. They had to do it. They did it because the case was made about the impact of education on the economy, short-term impact. A lot of the Australian strategy still revolves around how many dollars they can get from foreign students mm -hmm. in the four years the student studies. Absolutely, Canada gets $8 billion of direct expenditure because of foreign students in this country. It's huge. And you know, we heard this morning, it's bigger than lumber. Yeah. It's bigger than many other yes. sectors. Look. The Canadian government is now waking up to this fact. Yes. They're beginning to understand just yeah. as Hopefully. these other sectors need support, higher education needs support. Not, I completely agree with Indira, not to the level. It's, it's not there to the level we need it yet, but we're waking up to this fact. The real win is long term. Yeah. Canada integrates immigrants better than any other country in this world. When we bring these young foreign students to Canada, to our college system, to our university system, whatever we have, we have the opportunity to keep them here. And even, I would even argue, even when they go back, we have the opportunity to make them Canadian ambassadors when they go back home and use them as levers to build the economy here. So I think there's a huge potential. Um, you know, we've done surveys of foreign students when they come here, um, and they just absolutely love Canada. 90% of them want to stay in Canada. So we still have to think through that mechanism. What is the mechanism to hook them up with co sectors. companies, with yeah. different sectors, so that we build the networks that they need to stay in Canada. I, th I actually think that keeping one-third here is way too low. Yeah. We need to get to two-thirds, yeah. three-quarters, yeah. but that's going to require infrastructure right. to build connections from the universities and colleges out to society, 
something we need to think about. Um, we have co-op programs that are not yet wide enough into other parts of the system. Right. At the graduate student level, we haven't built enough mechanisms to get these people out. But if we do that right, I think we'll beat all these other countries. If I draw your attention then to this slide and not just the question of um, how many students do we have and how many will we need in the future in certain specialized trades and areas, what's your assessment of, of the mismatch between where we think we need people to be and what we're actually getting? And what strikes me about this is if you actually do the math on yourself, if you look at China, you'll see that 54%, you know, when you actually look at their university setup, are either in engineering or science, and in Canada it's 39%. And when you actually look at how the Chinese, now the Chinese have a much more authoritarian way of deciding who's going to which universities, and we can debate all day whether all those universities offer the equal engineering education you would want in an engineer. Um, but still, it seems striking to me that when you look at these pies, the Chinese seem to know exactly what it is they're going to need. And when you look at that 61% other in Canada, and you know, I was a history student, art <laughs> student, um, I enjoyed it. There's uh, nothing wrong with history. I wonder, what, what, what do you make of, of this? I mean, are, are, how do we structure our education resources, since you said it was a cost, uh, and, and we have to cut that cost, Investment. so that we end up in, a, in some sort of mathematical equation or ratio we'd like? Well, first of all, I, I was a bit intrigued when I've seen that, but when I look at the ratio of GDP of manufacturing in China versus what it is in Canada and services, if you would, versus what it is in China, it is probably reflecting more than we think the GDP, the manufacturing proportion of the GDP of China versus Canada. So I'm not totally shocked by that. And one could say that in China with time, because other doesn't could mean finance. I mean, Computer IT. Science. I mean, um, yep. so so I, I'm not totally shocked with that. Uh, to be very frank, it, it's probably reflecting the structure of the, of the two economies. Um, but if I can go back maybe to some of the comments, if I may, on the international education, because I, I, I was representing the private sector on that task force. Again, not throwing too many numbers, but the market, and I think it was McKinsey that had done that study, 2.8 million students that were looking for international mm -hmm. ed education in 2008, and mainly from the emerging uh, countries. That's going to go to over 7 million by 2025. If we look at the proportion of students, and I'm slightly different because I'm looking at K-12 colleges, mm -hmm. and we're below the world average, mm -hmm. slightly below. And interestingly enough, the proportion of our students going abroad, because it's, it's important that our Canadians cool. become okay. truly international yeah. as well. If we want to run global companies, and if we want to be astute, in, in the Pacific area, the high growth region, you want to have people learning, and the soonest the best. Same as learning a second language, the soonest the best to become culturally wise. We are 2.5 when the world average is almost two to three times that. So we're way below the world average in terms of sending our yes, brightest and best right. outside. Yeah. And when I look in terms of, of the benefit, I think we've mentioned very well the immigration. We have 200, nearly 250,000 foreign students here. Eight billion. This is more than the aluminum yes. income to Canada right now. I mean, so it is huge. huge. Absolutely huge. And when we look at how it's been growing from 2006 to 2010 by 28%, and now our competitive position from Canada to the rest of the world is increasing because yes. families that send their kids abroad are looking for quality of education, that's sure. But they're looking for stable society, yeah. open society, so their kids will be safe, yeah. and with opportunities to work and gain experience before they may come back. So the competition of U.S., U.S. have reduced its, its, its competitiveness versus, I mean, it, it's higher in Canada. They still attract more. But Canada has improved relatively. U.K. has improved. I mean, we, Canada has improved relatively to U.K., Germany, France, and I would say even Australia, because there's been, Australia, cost of living is bursting virtually. And they had a few events yes. in Melbourne yes. where students have not been well received. Yes. New Zealand is continuing going extremely well for all sorts of reasons. But if I look at all of these countries, the country with the highest capacity in terms of open-minded society is Canada. Mm -hmm. In terms of economy, we may not be booming, but we are fairly reliable society. So I think that getting a lion's share 
And when you look at the numbers, put 500 students, 500,000, and retain a third of that. You're fixing a hell of a lot of the productivity issues because you, you, you can attract the brightest and the best. Mm -hmm. And you fix a hell of a lot of the productivity because you boost innovation. And you fix a lot of the skills that you've just shown on that table. We need a more coordinated approach. Did you want to say something? We're going to get we to are. we're going to get to a Q and A session before right. the end of this, so right. we'll bring it up then. We want to get through some of these slides, so I'll go to you first, okay? Uh, this is one of the. Go ahead. Do you just go back to that uh, sure. slide? Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is not Aboriginal specific, but if we're you know looking at engineers, I, I um, you need to look at the post secondary or the primary and the secondary school system. What's happened to the training of our teachers? What's happening to the targets that we're setting? Um, you can, you know, my 16-year-old, uh, you can opt in and out can of math. You can Absolutely. opt in and out of, and I like the fact that there's math for the trades. I forgot the name of it now, but it's more applied, um, and I think that's the way, way of the future. But, you know, to me, you need to look at the structural things in Canada with our education system. And are we setting the right targets to actually get there? Let me tell you about my, my day last Wednesday in Toronto. True story. Uh, SNC Lavalin, he's on, uh, David's on my board, they, were, they brought some Aboriginal folks from up north. And a young girl asked, can a female, can a woman be an engineer? And, it's, and that's what women used to say in the 60s and 70s. Can I actually be a CEO, right? And at the same conversation, a First Nations leader from New Brunswick says to me, I need an engineering team because they're making an energy play. <laughs> That's the polar opposite in, in our community. We have, school, we have communities that don't have schools. Attawapiskat, we all know how to pronounce it now. Yeah. <laughs> They're fighting about education. So this is the right focus. In, mm -hmm. And what I, what I say to Aboriginal communities is don't look to Canada, look to China. That's where we should be setting our targets. We should be looking at what's happening on the international scene. How do we get uh, 35, 40, 54% in, into those? and the digital economy and these types of things. And forward leaders are thinking about longer term. I like the Mr. Dominic uh, Barton? Barton, Mr. Mr. Barton. Barton, sorry, Mr. Uh, Dominic Barton was talking about long run views and there were some views about, you know, Aboriginal people are experts at long run planning. They say my children's children. They have seven generation prophecies. Middle Lake Travel Council has a 50 year economic and community plan. So we need to, I think, embrace that. And I was just thinking about education when I was actually a prof. Just reflect, I was thinking about the New Jersey example he used. And now that I look back, I always had Chinese students in these Aboriginal education classes. And they felt culturally comfortable, they were welcomed. And today, if you go through a lot of economic corporations in Canada, you will see Chinese people. Ben Voss is a fellow from China, and he's the CEO of the Middle Lake Tribal Council like that. So it never sort of hit me until he talked about New Jersey, and we might actually have a really nice emerging opportunity looking at what Aboriginal people have done in the area of education and partnerships with Chinese, and the fact that we have many of them working in our, in our organization. Just want, uh, Indira, you want to get in on this? Yeah, I think t two points on the uh, science and engineering uh, numbers. What I think a lot of people don't know here is that there are plenty of students who want to do science and engineering. They can't get in. Uh, people ask me, you know, has your, is your enrollment going up? Well, hell no, because the enrollment is constrained by government funding. Um, and I think the, the private sector has an important role here to play in that if you don't speak to the government and say you've got to expand the science and engineering enrollment at the universities, um, we, you know, we can't do it. We, we have the space, we have the capacity, but we need the resources to hire the professors to do that. So that's point one. Point two is that if you look at the, back to the PhD problem, many Canadian engineering uh, graduates don't want to do PhDs. Why? Because there aren't obviously exciting opportunities. Whereas in the US, uh, you know, the Silicon <coughs> Valley and all of these places have provided the sort of entrepreneurial opportunities. Just a statistic that should scare us all. China had 2,500 science and engineering PhDs in the early 90s. Now they have over 25,000, more than the United States. Canada is still far behind on this in science and engineering. So my 
my feeling is that we've got to get uh, the disconnect in perception between the corporate sector, the government, about the notion of the willingness of students to do engineering. So that's the first problem. But back to the Aboriginal question. When I look at my own statistics in terms of Aboriginal enrollment distribution, we're doing well in education. Not well. We're doing you know, better than we were in, in education, in law, and in medicine, because we've had quotas and we've pushed hard. Engineering has been a real, um, what shall I say? There's, some, there's, there's a piece missing here. So back to the importance of getting uh, young, bright Aboriginal students who are bright and good in math early on, grade six, grade seven, getting them connected to universities to come to labs, spend time over the summer. These are some of the things that I think we have to put in place as a country to get them early. Can I just give you one statistic on science and engineering? In the last five, five eight years, the number of students enrolling in grade 12 math in Canada has been falling 3% a year, every year. The number of students in China enrolling in their final year of math has been increasing 3% a year, every year. That is a really scary proposition. The number of programs in colleges now that require advanced grade 11, grade 12 math has just gone off the charts because in going back to those job classifications, most of those jobs, if you're gonna be trained as a technologist in the oil and gas sector, you need high school math. When those kids aren't taking it, they're cutting themselves off from all these skills. And you know, we're not making this connection. At universities and at colleges, we're saying, okay, we need to train sophisticated people as technologists, as apprentices, and we're going to require these skills coming out of high school, and yet in the high school system, they're losing all these kids along the way. So we haven't, you know, we, we say we don't want national strategies and targets and things like that. Korea, which is a democratic country, has set national targets yeah, for technologists, for engineers. They're making a big push into master's degrees for, for engineers now. I think 25% of their master's programs they want, they're now targeting for engineers. So I think we've got to wake up to the fact mm -hmm. that we have to find new ways of engaging our kids in high school, in elementary school, in these kinds of disciplines. I personally think that we've got to get the universities and colleges involved in that process. And you know, I'm, I'm the last person to get into a, a bun fight between teachers' unions and, and faculties of education and, and, and boards of education. But as a country, we need our young people to get engaged in science and math, and we need to find new mechanisms to do it. I need to sort of blast through a couple of slides that I think have some interesting information because I want to move things along and leave a good half hour for questions. But I think uh, this demonstrates a kind of um, mm -hmm. a retarded in the truest sense of the word reality of what we're facing in which we're going to have too few high skilled workers and we'll have lots of low skilled workers but not enough jobs for them. And this is, mm -hmm. uh, this is a huge problem. And I think if you combine that with a demographic reality, all right, so here's the, the working age population, that line that represents now and you can see it yeah. dipping down. What I think a lot of people don't recognize, though, is when you look at India and China, and I know this was a big concern. I was in China. The party was always talking about what are we going to do when this population dives off. I mean, it looks to me like we should start basically recruiting Indians like crazy. <laughs> what do you guys need? Well, I'm all that? for that. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But maybe, I mean, if I look you know, at China, yeah. they, they are getting healthier and they'll work longer. So they're going to, they're going to, they're going to fix a little bit of that curve. Yes. But the big question, will they get rich before they get old? Yes. The Indians have much more chance yeah. to get rich before they get mm -hmm. old. Yeah. That's My okay. CFO is from India. Um, I want to make a comment about the post about high school graduation rates and, and sure. so on. And I think we should work towards eliminating that from all our st statistics in our presentations. And every presentation, and, and I work with companies and I talk about their messaging to Aboriginal communities, it's no longer about high school. We set the wrong expectations for all Canadians, yeah. including yeah. Aboriginal Canadians. We say, you know, because we measure high school completion rates. Yes. I want to measure post-secondary completion yeah, rates. Exactly. Everybody needs to graduate with certificates, diplomas, degrees, and multiple ones. If you meet my children, they can tell you which trade they'll take and which degree they would like. That would be the best productivity mix for Canada. And we, we get so trapped, and the Aboriginal communities are getting trapped into, they're so focused on grade 12 education, they're not having the discussion about engineers. So, I, I don't know, it's just a fun, I, I see these stats all the time, we produce these stats, and mm -hmm. uh, I think we just struck them out and said, 
the jobs for uh, high school student for high school grads is actually minus 0.3% or something like that. There's a negative declining growth in, in that market. And we're in a net negative growth market by 2017. So on the immigration side, I'm on the record publicly with the media that I'm in favor of immigration. Aboriginal companies, after they hire all their own people, are going to be have to hiring immigrants. And so Aboriginal people have to be engaged in the whole labor market. Just think, do you want to uh, add something to this? Yeah, and, and I agree with your point of uh, we need to start focusing beyond high school, but we probably need to walk, and I'll, I'll speak as the side of an employer that would like to be much more successful than we are despite all the efforts. But I think we need to walk before we run, and I'll get back to one of your points, it takes time and we need to be patient. In Australia, we are the largest employer of Aboriginal population. And we are extremely proud of that. And there's no reason we shouldn't be the largest in Canada as well, where we're located, where we're growing. But it takes time. I'll, I'll let, use our experience in Australia, you, where we've lowered the entry level. Because we, and here in Canada, I'm still battling, it has to be high school. Well, it just, doesn't work if you put yourself in that position. And I see it on the construction right now because there's different standards from contractors that do recruit Aboriginal people. We're up to 17%. We have, in operation, we can barely get 6 7%. Construction, and they do a superb job. Productivity is fine. They work safely. In Australia, we reduced. Took them virtually where they were much longer term view of building capacity, much narrower jobs, enlarging building capacity. And what we see now is the second generation. I was in, I was in the truck with, the, with, with one of our uh, Aboriginal uh, person, and he was telling me, and he, he was dreaming that his son would be a supervisor and maybe a department manager, but it meant he had to finish his school. I think it becomes then very powerful. I know they are very simple examples, but we will need to start to walk and be keen in, in completing a lot of the capacity building in the companies so that then the next generations will see more. And I think it all starts with the parents at the end of the day. Parents have the highest influence, and then next come the teacher and the friend. Mm -hmm. Parents will have a very different impact. I think each of you has alluded to some of the problems and disconnects between the education system and what you like to see. And there's a surprising polling result uh, done just for this conference. Uh, is Canada's education system up to the challenges? And if you take a look at the results here, uh, I'm not sure if Canadians are in denial, but it seems to be that the most people have a fair bit of confidence that the education system is up to these challenges. Do you find that surprising at all? We you, have have to leave soon. We, you have to leave soon, so I'll go to you first. I think we have an outstanding education yeah. system. At the university level education, I think it's absolutely outstanding. Is Our it up to the is, challenges of the 21st century? Uh, not, not, not so, right? So that's the thing. I think the question is how do we get it up to the challenge of the 21st century? One of the things we haven't talked about right now is that there is, we have reached a tipping point in terms of major changes in how we deliver education. Uh, we had a, a visit from a, a vice president of Google recently, and we are in partnership with, uh, likely partnership with them to talk about putting some major courses online. And I'm not talking about talking heads and video. I'm talking about absolutely spectacular technology for delivering online courses. This is going to change fundamentally, I think, how we deal with the 21st century global economy challenges in, in the following ways. One is to increase the participation rates of Canadian students in uh, universities, because you know, we've got a demographic problem, but we only have 23% on average of students going to university. What happened to the other 70%? If we can increase that number, then we can overcome some of the challenges. One of the challenges is really access, right? Access because there isn't enough space, or access for Aboriginal students because they're living away from the urban centers. If we can completely ride the technological way to provide access using a mix of <coughs> online and on-campus courses, we could rapidly expand our educational system to deal with some of the challenges. So that's point number one. And I think we are, we are, we are moving, but we, sh we could move a lot faster. Secondly, India. Um, you talked about India. I had a long conversation with Sam Petroda, who's the uh, 
guru helping India think through its education problems. Good choice of words. And he said, you know, Indira, your business model doesn't work for us. The North American business model doesn't work for us. We have to raise a number of Indians participation in post-secondary from 11 to 20%. That requires us to build 1,000 new universities. Just think about the numbers, 1,000 new universities, and I don't know how many thousands of colleges, and we don't have the professors to do that. Here are opportunities for Canada. Absolutely. How do we play a role in, in, in addressing India's need without our standard model, well, you send your kids to us, pay us $17,000, and all will be well. Well, hello, there's a lot of those kids who can't afford the $17,000 tuition. Can we find a way to put online courses to brand Canada as offering education to India, and then work with Lorraine, I'm looking at you, and others, to bring those students to Canada for internships and get them to yeah. stay here? We've got to think outside the box if you're going to make a dent here. But Arvind, if I could ask you this question. My perception of this, though, is that for particularly provincial education policymakers, if there's a complacency in the country that, yes, our education system is up to the challenge of the 21st century, what possible impetus will there be to actually fine-tune or change or modify our education system to make it up to the challenge of the 21st century if most Canadians think huh, everything's peachy keen? Well, of course... When people do these surveys, they think about their own past. So you think about in the past, things worked well, so will they work well in the future? First of all, we have a fantastic education system in Canada, yeah. right from kindergarten up to PhDs. Right. I think it's the envy of the world, so we shouldn't lose sight of that. Yeah. The second thing is that I think that the business community has to be much more involved in the education right. system in the country. And, yeah. and economies are changing much faster than they did 30 years ago. The business sectors are changing fast. Um, the way we interact with the rest of the world is changing very quickly. We need flexibility in the education system. I think that you know, online tools and technology is going to play a huge role, but I'd like to see the business community and the academic community work more hand in hand. And um, I'll just give you this example that you know, we keep talking about the German model of apprenticeships, which is fantastic. I think we need to do more of that, and I think we need to copy that model into the university system. I like to see it in the graduate systems. I like to see us training our graduate students in a way that they're flexibly meeting the needs of the Canadian economy in the future. So, so yes, we're, we've done a great job, and, and there's no doubt about that. But just let me make one last point. I remember when I was a kid, everyone said, we got to get high school, every, you know, all Canadians should get a high school diploma, while the leading economy is saying everyone's got to get a university degree. degree. Today we're saying we've got to get everyone a university college uh, degree or diploma, when the leading economies are saying we got to get graduate students, we've yeah. got to get more people with graduate degrees. Right. And at the same time, you know, we're saying, well, you know, do we really want to invest in this graduate education? Is it really going to help us? You know, we've got 5,000 PhDs a year. Do we really need more? I, I think we have a huge problem coming up that we're not facing. The world is going to significantly change how it does things. Those construction jobs, mm -hmm. a bunch of them are going to be done through technology in the future. And if we don't train the kinds of people who can develop the technology and run that technology, advanced degree students, we're going to have 30 years from now, we're going to be sitting here saying, geez, you know, all these other countries produced all these brilliant people to run the technology, and what happened to us? Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm, I'm most worried. Yeah. Now, Arvind, I'll, so I'll add one other quick thing about, uh, no one's brought up point. ECD, early childhood development. So if we take a lesson from, you know, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the Scandinavian countries about their literacy rates, the, the, and the quality, the, the productivity of their nations, that there is an argument to look at the entire education system, including uh, early childhood development. I just want to quickly do the, the, go over this before we go to questions for the next uh, 25 minutes to half an hour. And Arvind, you alluded to the fact you'd like to see uh, business and uh, companies uh, show up at the table. Here you have basically a quarter of Canadians saying, yeah, I did get some skills assisted through my company. Uh, what about the other 75%? And I'm not sure what Rio Tinto Alcan's policy is for, for training and what you provide to your employees. But this would seem to be, on the face of it, um, a shortcoming. That's, yeah, that, that looks low. I mean, um, well, for us, there's always a minimum of uh, formal training. It's going to be on safety. Uh, it's going to be technical. It's going to be... Um, because, I mean, standards are evolving. So, I mean, it varies from, from the type of job they have, but it's typically way above 40 hours right. a year. It's going to be more into this, I would say, probably 60, 70 hours a year type of. 
So. Um, well, maybe that's something we can actually address through. Uh, through it the looks low to me. Okay. Yeah. We'll address that through the question and answer yeah. session. Uh, and, and this doesn't. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but this doesn't capture the fact that while there's there's two parts of training. One is ongoing training mm -hmm. on the work on the job on yeah. the workplace. And which is there. Where um, we know that Canadian companies are investing about half American companies mm -hmm. for on place training. The second part is training while students are going through yeah, the education exactly. system. Yeah. I, I think that the future that. is really going to be a marriage of jobs with education. Mm -hmm. And so this is, it'll be much more seamless. So students will come into an educational institution. <coughs> while they're there, they'll be working with companies that are, that are changing their, that are defining their needs. And, as, and then when they're in the workplace, it'll be much more fluid having students coming back and forth into the education system. So how do you make that marriage happen is a challenge that we're all going to face. And I think that it's coming fast on us. Okay, so let's go to questions. Uh, appreciate everything that you guys have had to say. I know that you wanted to ask a question. You might want to move that microphone over and just state your name again and then uh, ask your question. Hi, Eric Lamar from McKinsey. My question is, uh, it seems a no-brainer that having more foreign students in Canada uh, is a good idea. Uh, so what's, and you all agree on stage, and I think everybody's going to agree in the room. So what's standing in the way? So I think it's competition. Uh, you know, we have to, we are not, we have two, two problems. First of all, Canada is not as well known in the markets in which we want to recruit students from. We don't have the brand, right? So if you take a, a bright kid from the UK, you, uh, from India or China, particularly India, they all want to go to Harvard. They all want to go to MIT. They all want to go to CMU. They all want to go to Columbia. Uh, however, if we can put up really good scholarships, we can get them. Right, and uh, so that's point one. Point two is how do you create that brand awareness of Canada? And we talked a, a bit about the importance of, of branding Canada. Uh, and, and thirdly, I think it's about promoting, give, giving a sense of what the competitive edge is. So, for example, when I go to India now, I don't just talk about well, you know, U of A, you know, come and talk. I, I talk about Alberta and I talk about Canada, and the fact that uh, the huge opportunities that there are in a place like Alberta and Canada in what sectors, so energy, agriculture, uh, information technology. And then I say, if you come to these sectors, there are jobs, right? We, there are jobs for you. So it's about positioning Canada not just as a good destination for education, but as a great destination for careers for them and rebranding ourselves differently from what the Australians and the British are trying to do. I, I think that's number one. Um, we've done surveys in both China and India why some of the best students are not coming to Canada. The number one reason is they don't believe that we have jobs for them afterwards. If you go to India, here's the interesting experiment. Go to the British High Commission and the Indian High Commission in Delhi and look at the posters on the wall. The Canadian posters are all about tourism. Yeah. <laughs> the British posters are about the great places you can work if you go to Britain, the great educational opportunities for you. There's not a single education poster in the High Commission in Delhi. Okay. So it's how we branded ourselves. Let's think about MIT. MIT does a wonderful job recruiting international students, the, probably the best job in the world. How does MIT do it? Well, every kid who comes from a little town of two million people in India who does something, they make sure there's a story in the paper in that little town about what this kid did. When that kid gets a job at Google, they make sure there's a story in that newspaper about how that kid got a job at Google. It's a very sophisticated strategy to get the message out that coming to MIT is a great education, you're going to do world-class work, and you're going to get a great job. That's the kind of strategy we need. And it's going to have to be, it, it's guerrilla warfare. We know the best students at the IIT system in India are get, now getting offers as second-year undergraduates to go to some of the best universities in the world. This is how vicious the war is. Yes. We are going in. My university sits in third year, you know, third year undergraduates apply to grad school in their fourth year. Now we wait for the applications. Princeton has been in India recruiting the best students, a second year undergraduates, giving them scholarships and scooping them up. It's a war, and I think we're a little bit late to this war, but we're waking up to this fact. Right. But I'll turn this around. I still think we have the biggest advantage in the world, and that is a multicultural society that integrates people better than anyone else, we're more welcoming society than anyone else. If you look at the problems Australia's had with some of their foreign students and what's happened, and the press, the negative press they've gotten, we would never get that press in Canada. Because if 
a foreign student got beat, and we've had problems with foreign students. I mean, yeah, we'll we talk have. about some of the we problems have. we've had. Yeah. But when that happened, the Canadian public was repulsed by it. So we didn't have to worry about what they were saying about there. We ourselves were upset. Okay. That's not what happened in Australia. Did you want to add something quickly? Because there's uh, more questions there. No, I would only say in terms of branding, just to finish. Australia, when they really started shifting upward, they've multiplied by five their branding budget. So, and again, in Canada, it's a provincial territory, so we all virtually compete with one another. We're always coming small. So what that task force has been trying to address is a more coordinated approach more scholarship, more branding, more budget and branding. Yeah. I, I would say that is a mark, uh, just reiterate, it's a marketing challenge. Use immigrant entrepreneurs in Canada as a way to brand and welcome people. It reminds me, uh, years ago, a few years ago, there was a CBC documentary. There was a website, notcanada.com, and it was stories of immigrants saying why not to come to Canada because of their bad experiences. So it's about, we've got to get it right here. We've got to do it right, and uh, I think People need authentic messages, and using immigrant entrepreneurs as a way to deliver that message would encourage and pull more people. Uh, yeah. You? I'll try to get to as many as I can. So and I know we'll uh, when, when you leave, yeah. make sure to give your microphone to that guy, otherwise people <laughs> are going to hear you wherever you go. <laughs> <laughs> to the airport. <laughs> My name's Bonnie Schmidt, and I'm president of a not national not-for-profit organization called Let's Talk Science. I was involved as a co-author in one of the position papers. Great panel, really appreciate it. And I was really thrilled that there was commentary about the K-12 or pre-K to 12 education system, but it almost seemed as it was more of an of a afterthought and a filler. And I'm wondering, how do we get as a consistent approach in all of the discussions that we are looking at pre to K to 12, as well as post-secondary, and whether some of the challenges are because of the constitutional issues, and who do we need to help lead a charge on a national vision? So that, that's one I want to table with you. But I do want to just underline Arvid's um, observation that interest in science and math is declining. We published a paper in June that really does show right across the country, although there's still quite a lot of people who are not getting in at the post-secondary level, yep. as Indira mentioned, we're actually graduating probably 60% of our high school population who doesn't even have the prerequisites to go into it. So, I'll let you go. It's interesting you say that because in St. John's, for instance, on the morning show that I do there, we've had a story recently from Memorial University with Memorial saying, all these kids are coming through the public system, passing in math. To get to university, they are way below where they should be for math. Yeah. You go to the high schools, the senior teachers say, well, actually, this is a problem that starts down in grade three and grade four. And then you go to the elementary school teachers and say, well, you know what? These guys should be counting in kindergarten. And everybody is sort of doing this. It's, Meanwhile, it's finger pointing and passing yeah. the buck. So here's right? something Australia did, which I thought was really innovative. They decided that there is no K through 12 undergraduate and graduate school. They decided it's K through PhD in math. And they've got graduate students working with kindergarten kids in math. And I don't know how they do this constitutionally, because you know, in Canada, if we tried to send our students, our graduate students, into math classes, I'm sure oh. there'd be a ruckus. But, so I'm, I'm not a constitutional expert, but they started funding programs that cut across the entire spectrum, mm -hmm. because they had the same problem, that kids were not, they were losing interest in math way too early in the system, and what they found is they have all these foreign students who, for some reason, loved science and math, and they said, let's just hook them all up together. Mm -hmm. And they're running a bunch of pilot programs, and I think Let's Talk Science is the kind of platform well, we could use well, we, to yeah. make these connections happen. In Canada, we actually do work with 36 universities and colleges, including U of A, which is a really strong site. And we put about 3,000 volunteers yeah. into classrooms yeah. every year, largely masters and PhD right. candidates. Yeah. So at the informal level, we're able to deal with those getting over the boundaries. So what do we do well, as a country and, to have and so when we do internships vision. for our graduate students and our undergraduates, why not have internships yeah. in school systems? Mm -hmm. Why don't the, we the see latter that? part of her question though, and I think this is the key of this whole flipping panel, how do we develop a national vision right. in a constitution that causes all kinds of squabbles between the provinces <laughs> and the federal government which tries to the back door sometimes well, I think to you do it in a sneaky science way. studies right so you do it by having 50,000 instead of you know you build up the 3,000 to 50,000 good right for you and keep it under <laughs> keep it under the radar so nobody complains about it or you have to have a federal provincial dialogue and decide this is too big a priority yeah. to keep talking about constitutional wrangling yeah. i'm not a constitutional expert 
I'm actually a believer, you just start doing things. And then later on, you know, ask forgiveness, not permission. So I'd actually support having tens of thousands of kids and, you know, having a version of co-op for mm -hmm. young people to go into the school system. But you've got to do it en masse. I mean, 3,000 is only yeah. touching, not even touching the problem, right? We've got to have this engagement. Here's another thing that's very interesting. I, I, I teach computer science, and, and I survey my students sometimes on what they want to do. It's incredible how many young women, we only are 21% young women in computer science, it's just a travesty. How many of those young women would love a chance to go into high schools? So if we built these kinds of mechanisms, I think we'd attract more young women into math, computer science, engineering programs, because a lot of them do want to do this kind of mm -hmm. translational work. So, Kelly, I just want to get Kelly, you want to say something about this? Well, uh, I think it's going to need uh, private sector uh, leadership voices. Um, in the oil sands, all of those employers care as much about the skills and education as Newfoundlanders as they do about Albertans and the rest of Canada, because there's a direct flight from Newfoundland every day to Fort McMurray. <laughs> So I think the way to accelerate and get this, the Fed should have never given away uh, this. We have 13 jurisdictions and layer on top of it the Aboriginal jurisdictions and uh, we're a small little country with all of these different differences. So I, that's what I think is needed, is private sector leadership that's gonna pull and force a conversation about national standards, national leadership, um, better as economies of a scale of transaction when it comes, comes to education. The other thing is, it's so sort of almost glib to say we, we need more engineers, but you, you know, there's one psychologist that, that really impressed me, and he said, there is a critical age, and it's grade three, and if you, if all employers look at this as, as, and as children as our workforce, right, really as children, they are going to be our workforce, and you take a very self-serving interest in this, you say, at, eight, at, at grade 10, how old are you in grade 10? 15. Or sorry, grade three. Eight, 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 eight nine, right? Eight, you, everybody goes through a big transition from learning to read to reading to learn. Okay? So if you miss that stage, you never catch up. Mm -hmm. And we spend all this money on these programs, to your point, that you know, they, we have all these remedial programs that we used to not have. So I think there are some really interesting uh, opportunities that if there were some interventions at grade three so that every kid in this country was tested and then you had interventions so that they catch up, we would eliminate some of these downstream problems and eliminate so many of these programs that, that we have. And I, I see them on the Aboriginal side, I see them on the non-Aboriginal side, but I think it takes uh, educators that have a lot more uh, experience than I have to really help us probe and come up with these solutions to develop uh, the other one is, today on the news, you've all heard about the happiness index. <laughs> Guitar's measuring their happiness, G, GMP. It's an interesting idea in terms of, well, how happy are we? So there's another sort of dimension to this that, yes, it's about productivity and education, but I, I, I do like this sort of happiness index, and, and I think it's a thing that pulls us all together to think about what do we do to make a, a great civil society. Right, Indira has to catch a flight, so I'd like to thank her uh, for her contribution to this panel. Uh, you want to go ahead? Can you just pull the microphone over towards you and push that button? And I'm Dan Music, the, uh, now with the conference board, but a recovering academic. <laughs> <laughs> I was 13 years as a dean, um, just coming out of that period. Um, but, you know, there's, there are two things I haven't heard about in terms of the barriers to bringing more international students. First of all, uh, I can tell you that the second most frequently asked question is, why can my kid not get in when you're bringing all these international people. We don't have a dialogue in Canada about the fact that we're going, we can only fund so many people on a provincial level, or call it federal, but it's provincial, uh, and we're going to, we'll take additional international students. Right? That's the sort of problem that I dealt with uh, intensely, I will tell you, for the last five years. We were taking one in ten qualified students in our undergraduate program. One in ten. All right, but... So the most intense question was that one in terms of international. The second is, and this is sort of an ugly point, but frankly, we do invite them in, the graduate students in particular. Um, we do have great uh, cultural absorption capacity, and that is all true, Arvind. But it turns out that uh, we don't give them jobs. Yeah. All right, we have the most overeducated, in some measure, some of the most overeducated workforce. We don't absorb these students 
So they walk back to their country in many cases and say, well, it's great, the education was terrific, my classes were great, uh, I can get a work permit, uh, but I can't stay there because I can't get the job I want. If I can, maybe for the first one, um, from, I mean, I'm, and I'm not a specialist of education, I'm running a business, but I, I'm very interested in education, obviously, uh, as a parent and as an employer. The element of competition between locals and international was intense in certain schools. What was not spread, again, my reading, because we had a lot of consultation with different levels, was not spread to a level that, I, that was clear that it was such a huge issue in terms of capacity. Mm -hmm. But they were hot spot again in certain area where the sensitivity of the local population was becoming uh, very significant. One of the elements that has been discussed in that workforce is can we do a better match between who's coming versus the need and sponsor having companies also sponsoring so that they get, you build that connection and get a better conversion rate at the end of it. I thought that you were going to name the immigration issue with the people being rejected and the complexity of the documentation to get them in Canada. So they had to lie, no, I don't want to stay, or they couldn't get in. Because if they would say that they wanted to stay, they were rejected. So a couple of nonsense like this would be paperwork to get them in. Um, that still, I thought that because that was really a top one in our discussion, but that one can be relatively easily fixed. I would say with recent legislation, that's, that's changed, especially if you come into a graduate program. Um, they've, they've streamlined that process, and you don't actually have to answer that section. Yeah. Sir, so I have I, a suggestion. Uh, today I saw Mr. Gupta had a, a slide with Kentucky Fried Chicken. KFC penetrating China, and uh, KFC, by the way, is what some people refer to as traditional Métis food. Um, <laughs> uh, and I can say it because of my Métis, my three roots. But here, you take something like KFC, and, I, that, and on the side of it, it does say, we want you in Canada. It is this messaging about using people that have already penetrated, that are in there with brands and products and things like Kentucky Fried Chicken, and uh, I mean, it's not too far-fetched to say that you could coordinate a message to say, Canada, check it out. We want you. Great opportunities. And I think it's that type of, you know, and, and that's what we're doing inside the Aboriginal community. All we're doing is exporting that type of thinking internationally. So, so, so Dan, you bring up one of the great conundrums of Canada. We are performing very poorly on the innovation scales. We're not graduating nearly the number of advanced degree students as other countries, and yet the opportunities are not there for the students that we are graduating. I'll give you one statistic that just is confounding. The average starting salary for a PhD, Canadian PhD graduating in Canada is 30,000. <coughs> that same person in the US is 90,000. So we graduate half the number of PhDs as the Americans per capita, and starting salaries in Canada are 50% less. It's something that, you know, I've talked with a lot of people at the OECD about, and their view is the problem is we're not graduating enough PhDs. Now, it's kind of a counterintuitive thing, but let me, let me try and explain why. It's, it's one of these things where unless you have a critical mass of people in certain areas, industry will not be attractive to come and establish themselves in those areas. So I had a lot of friends who worked at Nortel and VNR, and all those jobs were shifted to San Jose. So they were moved lock, stock, and barrel to San Jose. They had their salaries doubled to move because when those companies needed to expand, they could get more workers very quickly. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we've done some work in looking at where people, who is it that runs R&D and innovation groups inside companies? What kinds of managerial skills do they have? We are not producing enough managerial talent in this country to create the innovation jobs and to maintain those groups in Canada. So we almost have the problem that we're producing, that the ore body in Canada is so thin, it's not worth mining right now. And if the ore body was thicker, then we'd see companies coming and establishing those groups. So I think it's really one of the biggest conundrums we have in this country. Do we want to be an innovation society, which is we've got to produce the talent that's going to attract the companies to build the R&D groups in Canada to start bootstrapping that process? Okay. And so... Fantastic question. Yeah, and uh, I think your answer is very well posed. I do want to keep the uh, questions open, though, as I promise to try to get as many as possible. 
I recognize you. Um, I'd like to take it maybe away from education for a while and talk about immigration. Sure. Do you state uh, your name again? And, uh, uh, Art DeFerre from uh, Palace of Furniture, Winnipeg. Um, uh, and I, I think education is incredibly important, and I, I certainly endorse the, the greater number of students. But I think the larger number of people are still going to come through other streams uh, to solve that. And, and one of the things I'd like to point out is that, in fact, what, what the student thing does point out is that the, the solution to this isn't a single thing. It's a whole number of sub-strategies, including students, and even within the immigration, there's a number of sub-strategies. And as some of you may know, I'm from Manitoba. We pioneered the Manitoba Provincial Nominee Program. I, I chaired the process that started that, mm -hmm. and it's been very successful. Now, c Manitoba, counterintuitively, is not a place where people in the world want to go to. In fact, Prime Minister Kretzian, when we introduced it, told me personally, Mr. DeFerre, don't waste your time. Nobody wants to live in Manitoba. True story. <laughs> um, and, and, but the, today, the, 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 the growth in population, the, the rate of immigration, growth in population in Manitoba is 200% the Canadian average. People don't know that. 200% the Canadian average. And we're projected to grow faster than any province except Alberta for the next 20, 30 years if we're allowed to maintain our immigration program. Now, the other part of that is because we could run our own program, we could figure out who we attracted. So we attracted the welders and the tool and die makers and, and these kind of skills who don't have the PhD problem, who don't have all of these. We have complete social acceptance and a complete economic absorption. Now, that isn't the only answer. The oil sands may need something different. But I think Canada is a very large place and very diverse place, and we need to have, str we need to have strategies which are maybe differentiated you know, somewhat by that. And so I'd encourage that. The other comment is going to make... Is there, is there a question based on the Manitoba experience that you're... Well, well one of the things that I... Is the, the question over there is that Jason Kenney... Now, uh, all the provinces want uh, provincial nominee programs, and the problem is we designed ours because we weren't attracting by the federal route. Now, the more he standardizes it back to make it federal, the more we're going to lose out again. Ours will stop working mm -hmm. because it, it was the ability to, to be nuanced that allowed us to succeed. And so I think as we move into these, whether it's education or immigration programs, right. I, I think we have to allow them to be, to well, be nuanced uh, in, in their different ways. Otherwise, we will not succeed. Okay, let me try to put this to the panel in a sense. If we have a quiver of arrows that we're going to try to fire into this problem, one of those is international students. If the other arrow is immigration, and we have actually spent a lot of time in this panel talking about education, what about immigration, especially when you look at those previous graphs there about the aging Canadian population, the aging Chinese population, and the not so quickly aging Indian population. What are your thoughts about uh, what this gentleman just asked with respect to immigration as a solution, or part of the solution? Yeah, and, and it's gonna be a tough, um, I mean, a tough call because I think it's gonna be again a combination of attracting and probably completing the skills because on these skills, a lot of them are difficult to attract because they're getting short in the countries where they are. So this is where the key 12 and the technical skills will also be critical to refine it to the level we wish. They are rare to attract. But more globally about immigration, because yes, you're right, we need to be more targeted and have better strategy for branding, marketing, and all of that. And we'll need to probably make choices that are not easy. We cannot be only social immigration and import unemployment. We cannot be strictly, I mean, zero social immigration because we've got a part to play in the world, but we will probably need a wiser balance in the years to come. If we want to grow prosperity and then be able to maybe accept more of social immigration, but if we imbalance it's going to be pretty critical. No, the, the, point, the point I want to make is in Manitoba, we have, hundred, we have yet to find one of our immigrants on welfare. I'm saying there are sick. One always takes the national problem and projects it back and saying, I think we can, we can, if we break the problem down, there are jurisdictions that maybe can solve the problem. Yeah. But when they, as soon as they make it national, they import their problems, their bad choices back yeah. onto mm -hmm. us. I agree. My question would be back to you, Mr. DeFerre, is that how do we take this very successful incubator or proof of concept and multiply that yeah. across the because country? Because right now it's not. Um, can it expand? Uh, my other sort of niggle, though, is that there is competition. And I remember 10 years ago I was on a panel. There, it was, there was tremendous competition for, for immigrants. And I think about brain drain. What's happening to those countries and those communities where we've taken those people and what can we do to actually invest in those countries so that we're helping them with that brain drain? 
because I think this is all going to come back full, full circle in terms of our, our relationship to success there. So I sort of throw it back to you, sir. I think the success of Manitoba is to focus on trade, uh, t uh, spe specialized trade. So Can you just say your name and who uh, Pierre you're Pierre Baudouin from Bombardier. Um, we talked a lot about university, but frankly, Canada is a very attractive place. So if I need PhD, I need engineers in aerospace, I can attract them. Where we create jobs with people that actually do the work in factories, uh, welders, machinists, tool makers, trades. Uh, all kinds of trades. And we talked about your lack of construction. It's got nothing to do with engineers. It's got to do with creating an appeal for our students for these trade jobs. And I think one of our big issue of uh, Canadian students in high school, we, we give them one avenue, it's university, and it scares a lot of, uh, of uh, high school students. If they had an avenue of a great trade jobs at the same time, uh, maybe they would become university students. So for me, I'm surprised we haven't talked about trades. I tell you, the apprentice program in Germany, it's all about trades a lot more than university. So I just put it to the panel, I think focusing on trades is the key to creating jobs a, a, a solution I, for Canada. I totally agree. And, and this is when I look at that and I look at part of the solution and probably with the, I mean, if we do a good job with Aboriginal population, I think we can. We, that can be a route that can create a nice path to get into, um, into the manufacturing system. Immigration, again, my view is that it's difficult to attract. Trace. I mean, and I'm glad to hear that you, you're, you're doing well because... No, absolutely not. We have, we could double and triple except Jason Kenny's put a cap on ours. There's absolutely no problem in attracting people. Absolutely not. Okay, well, I'll need to learn yeah. more from yeah. you, I mean, <laughs> clearly. But it's, you're absolutely right that well, it's, it's going to be an issue and, and, and it's going to be part, yeah, we, we are lo losing a generation on that. I mean, maybe that's going to be a good way to recuperate that. So, so uh, one thing that we could do, I think... Again, I don't know how to do it nationally, but have a more seamless flow of students between the various kinds of post-secondary institutions. I think that's also something Germany does a much better job than we do. So students could start in a college, move to a polytechnical, move to a university, move back to a polytechnical, as they understand where the opportunities are and where their interests are. And, and we do have this sign of sense in our high schools that you've got to make a decision in grade 11 what your path, ultimate path is going to be, instead of understanding it's lifelong learning and lifelong career choices. And I think actually some of these problems would be fixed much better if we had easily transferable students between our different types of educational institutions. And then industry, as, as the kinds of jobs we ha have changed, students can be much more flexible in where they have career choices. Maybe, maybe one last comment on that. I mean, just to give the relative perspective of trades, I mean, welders. The running gag in Australia right now is 10 years ago, mothers were proud when they could say, oh, my son is a surgeon. Now they're so proud when they can say, my son is a welder on the gas platform <laughs> earning 400,000 real Aussie dollars yeah. per year. Yeah. 400,000, so. But what is it in Canada? You know, welder in Canada is probably not perceived as a great job. But frankly, I can give you a lot of trades job that make a hell of a lot more money than engineers. Oh, Absolutely. yeah. And, and are great careers, but they're not... Um, and not socially. They're not socially at least promoted. Uh, we talked about university during the whole past. There has to be a re-education about the trades. I mean, I know in my new home in Newfoundland, I mean, trades are everything, and there's a shortage, and there's not enough people in the trades, and the guys in the trades have really nice houses and really good-looking girlfriends. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Mr. Bryson, I'll close things off with you. Let's get the microphone to you there, Scott. Uh, last spring, and one of the panelists talked about restoring the honor of the skilled trades. And when I, I couldn't help but think of that here today, restoring the honor of the skilled trades, there's never been a diminution of the honor of skilled trades in Germany. And one of the issues that more people are speaking about today than, than was the case maybe five years ago is this, this issue of income inequality. Um, and Mark Carney probably says it best when he says it's, it shouldn't be an issue of just income inequality. 
uh, which becomes a class warfare issue. It should be about equality of opportunity, and that's the crux of what you're speaking of, and that's where I think the German model is an important one. Finally, just on the whole issue of early learning and the focus we have on K-12, to there has to be a public policy discussion, and it has to be led by the business community, about the economic benefits of early learning, because there's no area where we can deploy public investment, where we get more bang for the buck in terms of lifelong uh, cognitive strength than in early learning. And if you talk about Fed-Prov discussions, this constitutionality issue, we can do it. You can, there has been in the past a government that signed agreements with every province and territory. You can do it if you're talking with the provinces, but this has been just a, a one. To wrap things panel. up on that comment, Scott, thank you very much uh, for the panelists. Uh, thank you. And also, the guy standing in the back there, Ross, is the person who invited me to be part of this. And I really want to compliment the people who've organized this conference. I've found the panels have been uh, intellectually grueling, uh, challenging, and just the, the quality of the discussions and all that. I've done, been to a lot of these conferences. There's a lot of BS at a lot of them. And I've really been impressed with the substantive grappling with some serious issues. So Ross, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for your good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.